distinct honor to welcome up to the podium Assembly Member Dr. Joaquin Arambula to the podium. You know, good morning. It's so nice to see so many familiar faces in this room. You know, having grown up here, it was, you know, funny earlier when Ellen referred to me as a politician. It's the first time a friend has insulted me right to my face. <laughs> you know, I like to consider myself a public servant. And I believe that because my father served my community as well. And it was growing up underneath these tables that I learned to care about my community, to want to give back. And so it's those reasons why I bring my daughter here today. Because we must be trying in the next generation to inspire those future leaders to want to be like us. And it's time that we unite and be in solidarity about a vision. And so that's what I wanted to come today and talk about, was both what we have done, but how far we have to go. I wanted to take a moment, if I could, to thank the San Joaquin Valley Health Fund for all of the investments that you have done. $4.7 million over the previous three years, and if I may say, $3 million last year. The investments that you are doing and helping to create the change that we want to see in the world is exactly the prescription that we need. And so I'm thankful for the work that you do to help us to continue to give back to our community. Now, I'm the assembly member for the 31st Assembly District. I represent half a million people. Now, if the San Joaquin Valley were a state, we would have four million people. We would be the 27th largest state in America, and we would be the poorest state. Now, we have problems. We've gone through trauma. Many of you have as well. Having grown up in these communities, we know the effects that just growing up in abject poverty happen to our kids. The adverse childhood experiences that so many of our communities are going through, just the sheer trauma of not knowing where your next meal was, not knowing if your parents were going to be able to come home. The fear that happens through so much of our community is traumatic and scarring and limits our true potential. So I like to bring my daughter too, because if it's good enough for her, it should be good enough for all of our kids because we need to be giving them the same chances that I got. You know, as a public servant, I believe that I was given an opportunity, and it's my job to turn around and hold that door open for future generations, yeah. to make sure that they can have the same chances that I did. Because growing up in the Valley isn't always easy. Growing up, Joaquin, with a Q in your name early on, <laughs> created some pride in who you were. It solidified that you were an individual, that you came from a special place, and that you needed to be proud of it. And so I am proud that I am the first Joaquin who has ever served in the entire history of our state. Because I believe that I represent a part of the state that has not had a voice for a while. And I enjoy this idea that I can be a voice for the Valley and fight for those who do not have one right now. And it's important that we raise our voice and that we are heard in our state capital because it's about darn time yeah. Yeah. that the problems that we have. <laughs> you know, it was a year and a half ago that I decided to leave the ER. I practiced in Selma. It was the raising capital of the world. I did not work in a ivory tower. I worked in the middle of a farm working community because that's where I came from. And over a decade, I took care of 50,000 patients. And what I knew were that the social determinants of health that were forcing people into my ER were the same community that they were going back out to. And so realizing that trying to see them one by one was not being effective, I decided to do something more. And I asked something of myself. I decided to do something crazy, un poco loco. I ran for office. I decided to leave my profession as an emergency room doctor because I can make more change in our state capital. And I'm proud to tell you that the people of my community elected me to send and be their voice, and I am now the chair of the Budget Subcommittee on Health and Human Services. Woo! You know, I, do, I know it probably doesn't sound like much, but that subcommittee oversees $154 billion 
Every dollar that our state spends in health care and welfare comes through my committee. I have an opportunity to have oversight on the programs and how we are delivering care, and I have to tell you that the status quo right now is not good enough. That we must have change and we must have our voices included in it. I was pleased to hear the earlier panel make sure that we have rep representative democracy. We all should be frustrated with what we're seeing at the federal administration and recognizing that our voices are not heard in this discussion. You know, what happened during that last panel that many of you may not have known unless you're getting CNN notifications was that the House just passed their tax bill. What effect will that have on us and our communities and to many of the programs and is that a representative democracy? You know, often our valley is forgotten and we're fighting every day to make sure that our voices are heard and I wanted to applaud all the efforts from the people who are here. But beyond the funding, you're empowering many of the nonprofits who do the hard work. I've met with so many of you. You know, I met with Luis and Reading and Beyond and was impressed with what you are doing in one of the poorest zip codes in our state. I met with Firm and Stone Soup and see the work that you're doing within our Southeast Asian communities and how you're providing a voice for an immigrant community that does not have one right now. I'm pleased that I grew up in the same zip code where Planned Parenthood in Marmonte is. It's the same zip code where I live now. And I know the hard work you do to provide health care for people who cannot go anywhere else. And so I'm proud of all the nonprofits who are here because it's your hard work with our community that actually makes a difference. But there's one who I wanted to call out just because they were not so nice to me. And that was Brian with the Street Saints, because we played him in basketball a few weeks ago, and he did not take it easy on me, and we were not successful. You know, February 8th of last year, I was proud that on the Equity at the Mall that I had an opportunity to address 1,000 of you in the rain. And I look forward to this next year. Hopefully, we can get 2,000 people, because it's time that our voices are heard. And I had 22 hearings last year in my budget subcommittee, and I want to invite you to participate. Because many of the programs that we have an opinion on, we talk about. When we were passing One California, when that came through my budget, I was advocating to get more funds. I was proud that the funds that we got will help our dreamers to go to the UCs, to CSUs, that will help with legal defenses. Those are things that happen within my committee, and I would love to invite you to participate, to use our office so that we can be a better voice. You know, it's important while we talk about the gaps in accessing care, that we also start by saying that it's going to take some action. That we have to have equitable access to care. Working in the ER, I knew that I could not see my people alone but I also knew that the providers did not always represent the communities that I came from. That while we have a state that's 40% of the people speak a foreign language, we have a physician and provider population that less than 5% do. Now, I introduced a bill last year to try to bring a medical school back to the Valley because we don't have enough access to care. And that... You know, currently we have roughly half the number of providers, both in primary care and specialty care, as LA and the Bay. <coughs> and I believe that we need to have concrete actions to help to improve it. So here they are. First, I'd like to see a strengthening of the UC Prime program, a wonderful opportunity to return physicians and providers to disadvantaged communities, rural communities, to make sure that we're training our future generations. Second, I was proud that last year we worked on Song Brown and were able to secure $100 million over the next three years, $33 million this year to increase residency slots for the state of California. Now my hope is we can help to open those places and communities that we come from because of the important need that we have. But finally, last year we were successful in passing a proposition on cigarettes and there was supposed to be funding in there to help our UCs to start training more, I'm going to make sure that we, as the state of California, do our best to continue training people into the future. And finally, if I may say so, it's time for our providers to look like our communities, to sound 
like our communities and to speak our language. Last year with the Equity on the Mall, you provided much data about asthma and hospitalizations that occur right here in the Central Valley, particularly to kids. Having grown up here and worked in the ER, it was a statistic that really stuck out to me. Because I can remember when we had the rough fires a year or two ago when my ERs were saturated with kids who could not breathe. And I was proud of the work that we are doing at the state of California to try to make our environment better. But ultimately, it has to be about access to quality health care. And I'm proud that as the state of California, we had health for all kids. And that I stand to defend that investment that regardless of immigration status, that all kids get access to health care in the state of California. And I believe we need to figure out how do we continue to expand that. How do we make it health for all young adults to better match what we're doing with Obamacare? How do we figure out a way to increase access to care so our young can start dealing with the trauma? You know, things like the diabetes prevention program that are evidence-based by the Center for Disease Control were never funded by the state of California for our Medi-Cal population. Last year, because I brought an emphasis to prevention, I was able to include it for Medi-Cal patients. What it is is essentially a scare you straight program if you're diabetic. Within the first month that you get diagnosed with diabetes or pre-diabetes, you have an opportunity to talk to people who actually have the same disease processes to tell them about your own symptoms. What it's like when you lose your eyesight, what it's like when you lose a leg, what it's like when you have to go to dialysis three times a week. And what it does is su successfully help to prevent disease and not just treat it. Because the answer can't be that you keep sending them to me in the emergency room, but that we actually prevent disease from occurring. Things like asthma and prediabetes are things that we can adequately affect if we have programs. Last year, we were also able to increase funding for adult dentical. It may sound strange, but we right now only fund complete dentures. If you lose one tooth, we, we didn't do anything. If you lose two, we didn't do anything. But if you lose them all, we'll replace. <laughs> we were able to return the full adult dental care so that adults can get the health care and preventative care that they need. You know, along with all of the issues that we see at our federal level, you know, I, I struggle sometimes what our role here in California must be. And coming from the Central Valley, we have a responsibility to raise our voice and to be a part of that change. I sent 11 bills to the governor's desk last year, and I was proud to say that all 11 were signed. They span to various categories from veterans affairs to social services to education and, and health. I want to talk about a few of them if I can. Having three young daughters, a two, four, and six year old, I can tell you I know the importance of early childhood education. Yes. What preschool does for them and how it allows them to dream about what's possible. So we have an increasing minimum wage that many of you are aware of, but you may not have known that the child care subsidies were not tied to those increases in minimum wage. So many of our families, many of our neediest and most vulnerable families were not able to access the child care subsidies that we need. Last year, Fresno County alone sent back $9.6 million to the state of California. And I'm proud to say that we carried a bill this year to create a pilot program in Fresno County that will help to open up 1,300 child care slots for our county to help. I talked about earlier about ACEs and the need for us to deal with the trauma that we see. You know, ACEs, if you're not aware of it, in my opinion, is the single largest public health discrepancy that no one's talking about. 
that they're not addressing the struggles that so many in our community have. And I want to tell you that I went and fought for ACEs in our state capitol. You know, Medi-Cal has something called the EPSDT, Early Periodic Screening of Disease and Treatment. It's a screening test we can do for kids. And I was able to include ACEs into this EPSDT, so now all Medi-Cal kids, and since all kids are covered, we have an opportunity to start screening. And my hope is that by screening for trauma, we can actually build some resiliency. Because the data is showing that if you've had four of these adverse childhood experiences in your lifetime, that you're 12 times as likely to commit suicide. You're four times as likely to have heart disease, and my question is, why aren't we building the resiliency from eight? Why do we wait until they make a mistake at 18 and not give them the tools that they need right now? But we must start by asking the tough questions and collecting the data. Next year, I hope to take it a step further and start asking if there's a subpopulation that we can mandate the test. Can we look to our foster kids who go through so much stress and burden and ask how much trauma they've had to figure out if there's better tools that we can help them with? Because you might not know, but our foster kids have three times the teen pregnancy rate of our non-foster kids. And it's hard when you come from Fresno or the Central Valley and you're dealing with teen pregnancy and many of the problems we have not to want to get ahead of the curve. And so ACEs is one of those tools that will help out. I was proud that we had and extended the PhD program for nurses so that we can continue to train further nursing professionals within our community. We worked with the CalFresh program to secure employment and earnings that are enough for people to help exit poverty. And since I saw CPEN was here earlier, I wanted to talk about AB 470, where there's currently a mental health dashboard that the state of California puts out, but that they were not collecting enough data points. That they were ignoring things like language and disaggregating data about ethnicities that they were not asking enough questions about LGBTQ and how we have mental health disparities. <laughs> and the reason why we decided to carry this bill for CPEN is they brought me a data point I could not walk away from. And it was that 92% of people who speak Spanish are not able to access mental health services when they need to because of language. And so having practiced for a decade and seen so much unmet mental health need, I knew that we needed further data to help us to drive policy. So that's what we did. I also want to say that I have the privilege of chairing the Select Committee on Healthcare Delivery Systems and Universal Coverage. Two weeks ago, we held our first hearing that will explore the ways to improve our state's healthcare system and provide universal health care for all Californians. You know, I believe that we must work hard to get it right, that we must plan the committee to figure out the tough questions about implementation, sustainability, and affordability. But with all of the controversy that we're seeing with this Trump administration and what Congress are proposing and threatening to do, Californians are rightfully concerned if they can keep and get health care, and whether there will be doctors and other professionals to help take care of them. And we know that people without insurance are less likely to get the medical care they need. The Federal Institute of Medicine put it succinctly, those who do not have medical insurance, they receive too little medical care and they receive it too late. And as a result, they are sicker and die sooner. I have seen this firsthand. Having worked in an ER where it was your responsibility to try and save your community, I know that our systems must be improved. And that we must find a way, as was brought up earlier by Craig, to stand in solidarity with each other, to band together as Californians and say that we can do better. That we must do better. Because we cannot have a system of the haves and the have-nots. This is not about those who are left behind because they're still in the shadows, because for too many of us, we have those family experiences. We know where we come from, and that some of us may be newer, but we must stand together. In this coming year, I will push for equitable health care policies and budget allocations and continue to advocate for the Central Valley. 
But I wanted to tell you that I bring a bit of urgency to this situation because I agree that we don't have time, that it's time for us to unite behind a vision. So I wanted to provide one. I wanted to tell you where my values come from, what drove me to become a doctor. Because I look around to my community and I knew that we needed more help. I knew that the people in my town didn't have anywhere else to go. And so I became a doctor because I wanted to come back, but I did it because I believe that healthcare is a human right. That every single person in my community is entitled to health care, that we must make it affordable and accessible and work for our communities, and that every single country that has ever done comprehensive health care reform has started behind this value. That you care enough about your community member that you'll stand up and fight. That you'll care enough to actually go and vote that you'll care enough to show up and demand more of your public servants and tell them that we need better health care than we're getting now. And I believe that we must do this by helping to shape the words that shape our state. Because in our United States Constitution, it talks about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and I don't know how you get there without health care. And I don't know how for too many in our community who are dying in their 40s and 50s that they're getting those opportunities to be successful in life. And so I'm standing and fighting and asking you to join me in this pursuit that health care is a human right, because I believe that we must find a way to include it in our state's constitution, that we must put it in words so that we are held accountable, so that we will fight in our community to make sure that we all have access. Because there's a beauty behind that as well, if I may is that this will be put to you. That it's not actually up to us. That we are not the power. That it's you. That it's the people of California who ultimately will be able to decide if they want to change their constitution to better reflect their values. Do they want to actually put in print that we believe that we're all equal? Because I was raised by my grandparents and parents, that we were all the same. Yo soy un hijo del valle y tengo un sueño, un sueño americano, que todos somos iguales y tenemos los mismos derechos y que aquí estamos y no nos vamos y son tiempo para el cuidado de salud. I think it's long past time for us to raise our voice and be proud of who we are and where we come from to solve the complex problems that we face. And I know that I cannot do it alone. I know that I am not the smartest person in my household. I know I'm not the smartest person in this room. I know that we must do this together, but I am a vehicle that will help to change the world. Because I left my career not to be a chump in a chair pressing a button, but to be a champion for a cause and to stand up for a community that has been left behind for too long. So I feel like I may be speaking too long because my daughter's in the back starting to move a little bit. <laughs> but want to tell you that I work for my community because I was inspired to do so by the sacrifices of others before us. And that it's our obligation to do the same right now. And I'm pleased that there are so many friends in this room who share the same values, who share the same beliefs that I do. So thank you for your attention. It's a pleasure to be here today.